Orinoco Tribune writes, Macron protests in Iran peaceful, but those in France unjustifiable. On Friday, the Secretary General of Iran's Judiciary Human Rights Office, Kazem Karabadi, denounced the double standards known by Macron in his statements when, on the one hand, he commented on the ongoing protests in France, and on the other hand, when he gave an opinion on the street riots that took place a few months ago in Iran, which were supported from abroad following the death of 22-year-old uh, Masha Amini from underlying diseases while in police custody. I guess this fits the adage, one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. For insight into this, let's turn to our first guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled Revolting Capital, Racism and Radicalism in Washington, D.C., 1900 to 2000. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So the French leader was one of the first Western leaders who openly supported the riots in Iran and incited social disorder in the name of so-called freedom of expression and assembly. However, now that France is immersed in protests following the murder of 17-year-old Nahel Merzouk, shot at point-blank range by an officer at a traffic checkpoint last Tuesday in, in, on the outskirts of Paris, the French president is appealing for calm. Dr. Gerald Horn, is there some inconsistency here? Well, clearly it is. Uh, we've known for some time that hubris and hypocrisy are the two emblems of the North Atlantic countries. And at the same time, I think it's important to point out that what France is undergoing and enduring now is a reflection in part of what's happening on this side of the Atlantic. What I mean is, is that France touts itself as a so-called colorblind republic. And that is supposedly the legacy of 1789 and the French Revolution. As a result, France tends to steer away from even collecting statistics on with regard to race and ethnicity and ancestry, uh, because supposedly everyone is equal. But Obviously, that's not the case, and obviously, that is a problem that we're enduring here in the United States of America in light of the recent U.S. Supreme Court decision seeking to overthrow affirmative action under the spurious and specious premise that the United States, likewise, is a colorblind society and therefore no antidotes or remedies to racism nor white supremacy are required. And that helps to unite Paris and Washington. But at the same time, France is trapped between two fires globally. On the one hand, despite sharing that resemblance to the United States in terms of this hypocrisy concerning a colorblind society, a France's position, particularly in Africa, where it purports to be a leading power is being eroded by the Africa command, being eroded by U.S. imperialism. And at the same time, uh, France is being manipulated by U.S. imperialism. Recall that uh, U.S. imperialism scooped up uh, an ambitious submarine deal with Australia that France thought it had locked down. Uh, keep in mind as well that France purports to be a leader of Europe but the United States has brokered alliances with Poland and brokered alliances with the Baltic Republic, helping to drag the EU to the right. And at the same time, France finds it difficult, uh, even under the EU umbrella, to stand up to China, nor to stand up to Russia, which probably explains the kind of Hail Mary pass that President Macron tossed just a few days ago, when he sought to wangle an invitation to the BRICS summit in South Africa in a few weeks, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So France is trapped betwixt and between, and the unrest in the streets is just an indication of the dilemma faced by French imperialism. 
What about the historical context here? You know, this uh, the person that was killed, the young man, was of Algerian descent. Um, when we look at the what's going on, you know, it's kind of like I remember uh, getting, you know, training for um, uh, 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 investigations. And, you know, you see somebody that's been stabbed 57 times. That's an emotional, <laughs> angry person who killed them, right? When I see the kind of emotions and anger that's going on now in France, I think of— Algeria, Morocco, the genocides that, you know, the people wiped out on the bridge in Paris. Your thoughts on that context? Well, France's relationship with this former colony in North Africa, speaking of Algeria, is quite fraught. And once again, the United States helped to pull the rug out from under of French settler colonialism in Algeria. Recall that in the time in the 1950s when future U.S. President John F. Kennedy was running for president, uh, he made a number of speeches and remarks seeking to undermine the French role in Algeria, which, of course, uh, culminated in Algerian independence in 1962. And so France also faces a, a dilemma with Algeria today because Algeria is a major supplier of natural gas. France and many European countries thought that with cutting off relations with Gazprom or seeking to cut, a, cut off relations with Gazprom, the uh, Russian natural gas giant, uh, they could then just lean on and rely upon Algerian natural gas. But the wounds of settler colonialism from France are too deep in Algeria to allow that to be an option. And so once again, France is trapped. And I don't think that its peers and competitors and frenemies in Washington should be chuckling about this French dilemma because I dare say that Washington soon will find itself in an even more perilous position than French imperialism endures this very day. And as we look at what's happening in France, it seems to be spreading. Rioters rampage through Swiss City. Saturday's unrest, apparently inspired by the disturbances in neighboring France, saw seven people arrested in Lusanne. Swiss police have apprehended seven people after rioting broke out on Saturday evening in downtown Lusanne. This incident came amid ongoing mass unrest in neighboring France. Dr. Horn. Well, Switzerland faces many of the same dilemmas that France does. Recall that French is a major language in this multilingual nation that we call Switzerland, particularly the area around Geneva, just across the French border, which also houses many international agencies, including those of the United Nations. At the same time, Switzerland touts its neutrality, and that is helping to bring it under pressure from its European Union neighbors, which wants it to take a more militant stance with regard to Russia. So far, Switzerland is engaging in a kind of half-hearted resistance, but I dare say that that resistance is not pleasing either side, is not pleasing Russia, which feels that Switzerland has gone too far in terms of turning its back on its historic neutrality, and certainly it's not uh, satisfying the EU neighbors, particularly France. And so this sort of dilemma that you see in Europe, uh, once again, is a reflection of an ideological problem, the ideological problem touting this so-called colorblind society, when even Ray Charles, if he were around, could see that these societies are hardly colorblind. In fact, they're militantly color conscious. Muslims across the world have strongly condemned the desecration desecration of the Holy Quran in Sweden's capital during a protest authorized by the police. They are not happy in the Muslim world. Your thoughts? Well, this obviously compromises Sweden's ability to join NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's being vetoed thus far by Turkey, which historically, at least for about four or 500 years leading up to World War I, was the spear carrier, the leader of the Muslim world. Uh, President Erdogan is very upset, as are many Turks, with this insult to Islam. You saw demonstrations uh, against the Swedes in Iraq and in Iraq's neighbors. And so uh, this is, once again, a reflection of the mon- monocultural nature of these European countries 
which supposedly tout their universality and their universal values, but actually that's just a cover for a naked kind of white supremacy and a naked kind of religious intolerance based upon a militant Christianity. And Turkish President Erdogan says, we will teach the arrogant Western people that it is not freedom of expression to insult the sacred values of Muslims. Is this rhetoric or do you expect Erdogan to extract his pound of flesh? Uh, It is not rhetoric at all. Erdogan has options given the present correlation of forces globally. Uh, Like Saudi Arabia, uh, he's making an application to join the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, thumbing his nose at his Western European allies in NATO. Uh, Keep in mind as well that President Erdogan has been neutral with regard to the sanctions against Russia. Uh, He's actually playing both sides of the fence, allowing drones to be sold from Ankara into Kiev, uh, but at the same time, entertaining uh, Russian business persons and tourists, and not to mention Russian business people, uh, who are landing in Istanbul and Ankara. So President Erdogan has options, and I dare say that he'll likely be disappointing the hawks in Washington. To that point, because we know he is a he is a the consummate strategist and the consummate fence walker, uh, do you think that he'll play his card, uh, his NATO card, in, in holding up um, so Finland's in and, and Sweden and Sweden's trying to get in. We got one minute. Correct. Correct. But uh, I don't think we'll know for sure until the Lithuania summit in Vilnius in a few days now, in fact, uh, next week. And it'll be very interesting to watch from the sidelines as the negotiations take place. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis. And we look forward to having you back. Thank you.